From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach. Your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Tis the season when I'm making more applesauce to freeze and baking pears for dessert or for breakfast. So what sweeter topic for today's episode than fruit? Lee Reich, who has written several books on the subject, is here with some fascinating history of the origins of the fruits we love and some how-to growing advice, too. So more in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top-quality spring-blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. Lee Reich, who gardens on his half farm, half garden, or farm den, as he calls it, in New Paltz, New York, is the author of many books, including the recent Growing Figs in Cold Climates. His latest is a juicy little book simply called Fruit, with 250 historic watercolors and some history of apples, pears, berries, and more. So welcome, Lee. Nice to have you back again. Once again, it's nice to be here. You and your fruit. <laughs> He's got, a, he loves I'm fruit, a, this guy. I'm a fruit nut. I know you are. Um, so uh, before we get started, I'll just say, let's have a giveaway of the book. It's kind of almost like a little gift thing. It's it's small and chunky. Like it can fit in your hand, you know. It's it's this fun little, little, uh, little thing. And um, so we'll have a giveaway with the transcript of this show over on awaytogarden.com. So yeah, so this project, I think, had sort of special interest to you because of a past connection to sort of the place where the watercolors that are featured in in it um or near the place uh where they're stored where they're archived tell us about how this began yeah well i um i had just finished my fig book last year and it came out and i wanted to take a little break from writing a book or a longer break and i was contacted by the publisher and uh, they said they had this book and they described it and it was quite different from what i usually write it's not a how-to book no Really, it's really almost like an art book, some history, some yes. fruit lore, of course. And I, as I said, I wasn't that anxious to dive into another book, even though this one would require less writing from me. But on the other hand, it just seemed like, geez, I feel like th- this. I should write this book because <laughs> yes. it seemed like it was meant for me for a number of reasons. One is that I'm crazy about growing fruits. I really like fruits, and I've been doing this for decades. And the other thing is the in, the images that are in the book were done for the USDA. I mean, it's odd, but the USDA hired a number of illustrators between the late 1800s and mid-19, up to about 1940-something. I can't remember what it is. And they hired them to do these drawings, these illustra- watercolor illustrations of fruits. And they're really quite beautiful. And I, besides liking fruit, I really like... Uh, uh, drawings of fruits or illustrations of yes. fruits have a number of other ones. And um, so that was one thing. The other thing is that all these were done for the USDA and they're housed in the National Agricultural Library. And I did my doctoral work in the fruit lab of the USDA right across the street from the National Agricultural Library. And I saw some uh, hints of other artwork, uh, fruit related artwork, when I go into the lab, uh, the main uh, lobby. Uh, when I worked there. So that was right. one thing that, that really, I, I thought. Good memories. Good yeah. memories. Yeah. And, and, and also and, I had been, yeah. I had been exposed to a lot of different varieties. Some of these varieties are pretty much unknown, but I, they had a big collection of apple varieties at the uh, Beltsville Agricultural Research Station where I did my research. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I really got to know and, and taste a lot of different apple varieties. Yeah. So why did they, why did, all those years ago, why were, and, and I think they commissioned mostly female uh, watercolor artists to do these, I think you say in the book, um, mostly women. And and uh, why why did they need these watercolors? Like, was it for reference so that, uh, what, what was the reason? Well, it started out, um, the USDA, um, this was a project that was in, initiated by somebody named uh, Henry Van Demmen in the 1880s. And he was actually an orchardist and nurseryman, and uh, and he wanted you know some way of promoting, I guess, his job and other people and similar jobs, you know, uh, selling trees, fruit trees. Ah. So he approached the USDA, 
and he was appointed head of the newly formed Division of Pom- Pomology, Pomology <laughs> Science of Fruit Growing, P-O-M, not P-A-L-M. Yes. And uh, it's interesting, I came across this one figure that the first artist they hardest, hired was a man, William Prestel, and he was hired in 1887 at $1,000 a year, which seems like a lot for 1887. And it probably was a lot because one third of the division budget at the time. And uh, oh wow! So so the um so the whole purpose of the project was really to help promote commercial product commercial wow. promotion of the fruits, but also so that you know if somebody went uh, to buy an apple tree and then then it bore fruit, they could uh, see that this is the same fruit that is this is right what it is. right. Right. And then I think there was a certain number amount of chauvinism in this whole thing about American. There were a lot of American varieties of apples that had developed. And uh, I guess they wanted to show, well, you got you Europeans have your apples, but we also have quite a few of our apples. Right now. But, so apples are not an American native crop. They sort of naturalized, I guess, since colon, the early colonists brought them over. But where do they come from? Like Kazakhstan or something initially? Is that their native land? Yeah, the, their, yeah. their origin is uh, in Kazakhstan in the mountains. But, um, you know, you would think that they were native here since, especially in apple growing regions, such as here in the Hudson Valley, there's wild apple trees all over the place. Right. So they have naturalized. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, in the book, there are many apples, or I think there's more apples than anything else in these little watercolor portraits uh, in this little, again, sort of like a gifty kind of feeling book. Um, so some, I mean, some have hilarious names like Red Democrat. Oh, I, I <laughs> wanted to mention that one. Uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> well, tell me. That, that was one. I mean, I know not, a lot of these varieties, people just, you know, they had a seedling in their in their property and they uh, and it bore fruit and they liked the fruit and uh, and they just made up a name. So I haven't never heard anything else about this red Democrat uh, uh, besides in this book. And there's a number of varieties like that. Another one that um, I don't know if this one actually made it into the book because, you know, I chose them on the basis of their name and how pretty I think the drawings were. Right. Uh, and also some with historical value. But there was another one called Ozone. So I think that one wouldn't sell that well either now. Huh. Now, so you just think about like people maybe selected a variety that, you know, popped up in their yard or whatever, their farm or whatever. So apples don't come true from seed. Like if I have a particular variety of apple and I take the seeds from the fruit and plant them, I'm not going to get that identical, genetically identical apple variety. Is that correct? Right. I remember um, when I worked, I actually also worked for Cornell in uh, fruit research. And when I remember years ago, uh, speaking to the apple breeder at Cornell, and they had estimated that if you plant an apple, say if you took a Macintosh apple, you took out the seed and you planted it and that seedling bore fruit, there's one in 10,000 chance that that fruit would be as good as the the original. Wow. Or even that it might be good. So you have to plant a lot of apple seeds to breed a better variety. But, you know, at that time, uh, in in this country, in the 1800s, a lot of apples, a lot of seeds were just planted. Uh, one Johnny Appleseed being one one of those people, right? So seedlings popping up all over, and there's a lot of bad ones, but there, are, you know, quite a few good ones that originated. So where did Red Delicious, speaking of a famous apple, um, unlike some of the ones you just mentioned, that you know. We've never heard much about or anything about. What about Red Delicious? Because well, that's course, ubiquitous now. Yeah. Right. First of all, I think Red Delicious is more infamous than famous. Ah, okay. <laughs> Just because it's of its quality. But uh, that originated in the 1890s on a farm in Iowa of a farm of Jesse Hyatt. And he thought it was really a good variety. And it, it looked quite, it looked actually and tasted quite different from today's Red Delicious. And I've actually grown it. You can still get um, cyan wood, which is how you propagate new apple trees. And you can make your own original red delicious. But uh, first of all, the color, it's its uh, sort of red and yellow striped. That's one thing. The second thing is it does have a delicious flavor, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so he uh, entered it in a contest with Stark Brothers Nursery, which still exists and sells yes. a lot of fruit trees today. And uh, this was in the 1890s, and it was named, he had named it Hawkeye, 
and Stark Brothers really liked it, and they uh, bought the rights to the plant. There was no plant patenting then, so you really no. had to protect your original tree, or people just cut stems off and they'll propagate their own. Right. And uh, Stark Brothers named it Delicious, and the name was later changed to uh, Red Delicious because uh, Stark Brothers in the early 1900s uh, bought rights to Golden Delicious. Oh, yes. So it was just to distinguish yeah. it, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, apples are not that easy to grow in the Northeast where they are, however, grown a lot, or especially organically, they're not right. that easy to grow. Um, you know, when, and, and I was in preparing to talk to you today, I was kind of looking at speaking of Stark Brothers and other catalogs that specialize in fruit, young fruit trees and ship them. They're not cheap. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a uh, young tree is and some of them were like a hundred dollars and some oh. of them were like 45 and 55 and 65 and so forth. But easily, some of them were a hundred dollars for a small tree, right? It was a lot. It wasn't, wasn't cheap. So making a decision on what to grow and so forth very important but then also once it arrives i I've, I've it's a little bit befuddling because it's been prepped you know for performance and you know to be in a good shape and so forth but what what are some of the initial things when we adopt a young apple like say we're going to order some this winter and plant them next spring we're going to well, keep pruning it or what what's... Well, the, the most important thing is site selection uh-huh and, uh, and there's a few things. First of all, sun, apples, like most fruits, yes, uh, need it. Do best if they have at least six hours of direct summer sunlight. Yes. That's one thing. Second thing is a soil drainage. They have to have good soil drainage. Yes. Uh, and that's a, and that that's can be changed. Uh, you can, you know, mount modify. That. Sure. And then uh, and then the next thing is to just plant it correctly. Uh, also, the good site. Is, involves more than just sun and soil. It also involves good air drainage, which incidentally, even though I love to grow fruits, I have the worst site. You're a flat a site, valley. aren't you? Right. Well, it's not flat, it's a valley. So all the cold air comes spilling down right. the mountainside right into my yard here. Right. And so you see a lot of old orchard or remnants or whatever, and even current orchards on hillsides. And no, no, it's not a coincidence, right? Oh, right. Yeah, that's that's my dream. They benefit there. from the warm air draining up right. over the land. Yeah, right I would now. actually rather have a good site than a good soil. Because yeah. You can always change the soil. Yeah. Um, and so, so those are important. And then we get the little baby and, um, plant it correctly, you said. Yeah. And I guess around here, uh, or most of the country, probably, uh, uh deer you have to have some protection against deer because right. they enjoy eating the trees and the fruit. Right. 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 Well, if only they could put two and two together and realize if they keep eating the tree, they're not going to get any fruit either. Yeah. They haven't gotten that bulletin yeah. alert. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, there's like, I think you mentioned in the book, there's like 7,500 varieties of known apples or something. And, and then pears, there's thousands of varieties of pears, but like, I don't even think I can name five. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. pears, it's interesting because pears, there are many, many varieties. Actually, I grow about 20 varieties, but, um, it's just that for some reason, commercial is only, uh, you know, what, how a fruit is picked for commercial uh, propagation and, and growing and selling is based on a lot of things. You know, how, what it looks like is very important yes. in the country. And also how well it ships, how easy it is to grow, you know, maybe what shape it is. And I guess pears have not uh, gotten all that diversity. No. I, I have to say that. So, so I grow a lot of different varieties of pears. And I've tried them, and if I don't like them, I just regraft them to another variety. And the variation in the flavor and texture of apple is really far greater than just about any other fruit I find. I, I, yes, the texture for me is one of the important things with pears, and that could be very different. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm more on the buttery side than I am on right. the other side. Right. So. so you don't like Asian pears then? Not no, they're too watery for me. I mean, and they're, they're good, but they're not to me. A pear is more that rich, buttery kind of. You know, I like them that way. And you know, as I, I think I wrote in my book, you can thank two Belgians for the butteriness of pears. Uh huh. You did write that in the book. Yeah. Yes. 
So that was in the 19th century, two Belgians. Uh, some one, One's name was Nicholas Hardenport, and the other one was Jean-Baptiste von Mons. And they, they planted thousands, because pear like apple doesn't come true to, from seed. But they right. planted thousands and thousands of seedlings and selected uh, some really good varieties. And pears became much more popular in a much wider range of varieties in Europe. And I think they still are than they are here. But there are a lot of very good varieties. One of the most famous ones that is, uh, I don't know if it's widely grown, but it's, if you ever taste it, it's probably the best pair there is, is uh, Comis. Do I end the Yes. Comis? I don't know how you say it, but yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so apples and pears, and in fact, all the pome fruits and stone fruits, I think you say in the book, all are in the rose family, different subfamilies, but they're right. all related genetically. Yeah. 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 And they're related to roses. Um, so that's another kind of interesting uh, thing about them. Um, well, they're not, they're not so close like apple. You cannot cross an apple with a pear. No, you can't, you no. can't even graft an apple on a pear. No, no, but they're more closely related than they are to a uh, you pomegranate. Know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I was going to say a fern or an oak tree, <laughs> but yes, that too. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so with the um, you also go so you you talk about pears and and again even though there are thousands we may know so few and so forth. And there is a range of, of textures and flavors, but most of us don't really know that as consumers at the market, you know. Um, and and then you talk about, you know, you get into other uh, fruits and, for instance, well, peaches uh, and how they, I guess, they've sort of naturalized in more in warmer climates, yes, in the south, the southeast and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, also, I have to name one, the name of one peach that I particularly liked that I mentioned in the book. And uh, I'm going to say it, but if you read it, it, it has much more impact. It's called Never Miss, because, you know, peaches often get frosted by uh, late spring frost. So I right. say Never Miss Peach would, uh, would miss those frosts. But it's spelled N-E-V-A, new word, M-Y-S-S. -S. I thought that was a particularly clever name. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and you talk about berries, too, and, and what's a berry and what isn't. Like, it is it... Did I get this wrong? Was I like falling asleep while I was reading, or, or you know, too tired to get it right? Was it as a banana and a grape a, a berry? What? <laughs> well, make it make it even better. Banana and a grape is a berry, but a blackberry and a raspberry are not berries. <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense, but it's kind of I love a kind of esoteric botanical esoterica, you know. So, so what's a berry? So a berry botanically. Is a soft fruit developing from the ovary of a single flower. Okay. And, you know, blackberry, you know, if you think about it, it's obviously multiple ovaries there. So you can tell that because you see, uh, if you look at one, what we think of as the one fruit, the one berry, it's really like all these tight little things together. Each one has a seed in it, and each one was from an individual flower. They're all sort of packed together. Well, that it actually... Uh, it, you know, it's not, it's from an individual flower, but uh, multiple ovaries in a flower. Okay. And, and so a raspberry and a blackberry and a strawberry, they're all called aggregate fruits. Okay. And a mulberry is a fruit such as you just described, where each, uh, each little round thing in a mulberry fruit is, um, is, has its own flower. So it's derived from uh, oh. multiple ovaries. Oh, but a banana and a grape are berries. Okay. Right. And a tomato. Okay. So I know everyone also says, well, tomato is a fruit, but a tomato is technically a berry. It's even, you know, right. to even distinguish it that, I, I see. Right. Um, Legally, actually, it's a, botanically, it's a fruit and a berry. Uh, legally, it's a vegetable. Right, 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 right. Inter yeah, and it's commercial. It's represented commercially as such and so forth. Yeah, no. So it's... if we get a parking ticket, it's, you know, vegetable or, or, or allowed to park there, but not fruit. So just to get back to some of the the tree fruits, so to speak. So, so like the pears, where do the pears come from? Not the same place as apples. And where do peaches come from initially? I mean, before right. they Well, came pears from... come from about the same place. I can remember somewhere, you know, in that part of the world, okay, uh, Kazakhstan uh, in particular, okay, 
And then uh, peaches and a lot of the stone fruits, peaches, plums, apricots, all those come from uh, China and Western Asia. Except with plums, it's sort of interesting because plums, there are a lot of na native plums and there are also plums that are native to Europe. So you have three different species and they've been hybridized. So, you know, some, some varieties are a mix of, uh, or most plum varieties now are a mix of, uh, you know, either Asian and or um, European or uh, American. Okay. Um, so we have maybe three, four minutes. I wanted to just ask some more sort of, if I'm thinking of ordering for next year, you know, to start my own little fruit world here, my miniature Lee Reich yeah. farm den. Um, uh, I've read that you need at least two different apple varieties within, I don't know what the recommendation is, 50 feet of one another right. or something for a good fruit set. Is that true of pear? Is that true first? And then is that true of pear? So in other words, I can't just get one apple tree and it's definitely going to be a good thing um, or two of the same one or reminds me of viburnums actually. Right. You, it, it's a, it's not generally you need more than one for apples, except for certain varieties, one of which I happen to uh, uh, taste and, and see it when I worked at uh, for the USDA. It's called Spencer's Seedless. It's a seedless apple. So it actually oh. it develops without pollination. But apples, almost all apples need cross pollination from two different varieties. Almost all pears do, although on the West Coast, um, Bartlett does not need pollination. And uh, peaches, for instance, are self-pollinating. So one peach tree will do it. Apricot oh. Apricots are somewhat self-pollinating. Ready for this? This gets even more involved. European pears are self-fruitful. But um, uh, I think American ones need cross-pollination. And then the hybrids have their own little quirks. Oh, my goodness. So you really have to do your homework is what you're saying is that, you know, when – we don't just order one and figure we're done. We have to, we have to look at really look into not just whether it's an apple or a pear or whatever, but which variety it is and what its requirements are. Right. Although if, if your neighbor has an apple tree, that'll work for you also. Right. right. As long okay. as it's a different variety. Okay. Okay. And if, and if you learn how to graft, you can graft a branch of a different variety onto an existing tree and to provide pollination. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And and for me, again, the hardest part is when the baby arrives is I always feel like, uh oh, am I going to know how to prune it right? And I mean, you wrote a whole book about that. Right. <laughs> right. Because that's pruning to be summed up for a young tree is um, do what's necessary, but make it the minimum amount of pruning, because uh, the more you prune a tree, the more it stunts its growth. And when a tree is young, you want it to grow and fill its allotted spaces as fast as possible. So it's already been prepared, so to speak, shaped for a good start by the nursery that sold it to you, presumably. So, uh, not not necessarily. Well, when one would hope if you buy it from a good supplier, right. yes. And if you buy it locally, often they like uh, small trees to look like small trees, but small trees that look like small trees grow into big trees that are too crowded with limbs. So you exactly it's more. Exactly. So a lot of times what you're getting uh, from an expert, you know, company that does get, send you what they would grow in their own orchards, you know, the start that they would grow. It just looks like what I used to call a whip or whatever. It's kind of right. like a, a linear thing, mostly. It's not all branched out like with a canop a miniature canopy, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally happy to get it. I mean, my ideal fruit tree is... Uh, a tree that's um, often bare root because you have better selection with bare root plants, but a bare root tree about four feet high with no branches on it, or maybe two or three at the most. Right. And again, for the consumer who hasn't been through it before, and doesn't have your confidence. It's a little daunting at first, you know, it, it, you take it out of the box and it's like, Oh, what am I supposed to do now? How do I get you to become a tree? But right. like you're saying, it's, it wants to become a tree. like, And especially if it's bare root, people think, well, this root has been out of the ground for who knows how long. Right. But if it's a good nursery, I mean, you put them in the ground, they just, and you, you, you as I said, plant them well, water them, and they just take off. Yeah. Um, all right. So we just have like a minute, and I just want to say, what are you, are you, are, is your garden put to bed over there? <laughs> 
Sort of. It's there's a lot lot to do. Ninety percent of it is, but uh, I'm I'm in the process now. I guess the biggest job is mulching. I have this humongous pile of uh, wood wood chips from uh -huh. orchards, and I'm um, figuring out the best way to move it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of ways which I've been doing, but uh, to the various uh, parts of my farm, then it's heavy. Well if you have any extra time, you can stop by over here, cross the river and uh, lend a hand. <laughs> Likewise. Okay, we'll we'll do a swap. <laughs> well, Lee, I'm glad to speak to you as ever. And congratulations on this fun little new book. And it's very beautiful. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the watercolors are gorgeous. So um, and it's fun to learn some of the history and so forth of these favorite plants. So thank you so much. And I'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, good. Thanks. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. And I hope I'll talk to all the rest of you again soon too. Now don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and maybe fruit growing meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.